Jerry or Gerald uh, Couture is known to uh, most of us except of course our uh, visitors from Hong Kong and uh, 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 Cave. Uh, he is professor in the Department of Educational Policy Studies and uh, in addition he has many accomplishments which I won't read in the interest of al allocating the time to him. Uh, he has uh, been a visiting professor in uh, three universities in Turkey, so maybe he has an answer to that uh, Byzantine nature of Ukrainian politics and society that was mentioned by Professor Oleksienko. Uh, here at the University of Alberta, though, uh, he ha was the recipient of uh, two graduate teaching awards. He focuses in his research on the geopolitical economy of higher education uh, reform. Uh, his current work involves exploring the geopolitics of higher education in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea region, which he encapsulates uh, in the uh, interesting t a title, A Civilizing Barbarism for Neo-Capitalism. So today, uh, he's offering us an historical perspective on university research in the Black Sea region, which uh, we hope is not as black as the sea on which those countries <laughs> sit. Thank you. <laughs> Jerry. Thanks, Walter. Thank um, I'm glad we took a, a brief <coughs> break. Thank you, Olenka, for that. I was beginning to wonder if it was going to be a little bit like uh, South Korea, which I worked in, where we start at 7 a.m., and go through till 5 p.m. and then start eating and drinking and then wrap up at 12 and then start again at 7 a.m. <laughs> so I don't, so if there's a, such a thing as a Ukrainian mentality, maybe starting at eight and going to four and working hard and <laughs> thinking hard and, and having a lot of good conversation is, uh, is something that we can generalize. So hopefully I can do that. I'm aware also of the time, so I'm gonna try to shorten it up uh, a little bit in different places uh, just for us and then talking to Alenka on that. I just put on, the, on, the, on this board here, this circle, if the circle was to capture our mentality or how we think about it, I always think that there's a gap there, there's a hole, uh, or what Leonard Cohen calls, right, the, the, the crack where the light gets in. I don't know if you've heard that, uh, but that's the crack where the light gets in. And then here we have maybe the scientific method and built the two parts of uh, demonstration through evidence and uh, maybe deduction through logic or other kinds of logics and they come together and in this gap we usually fill in something <coughs> fills it in it's always there we know this from thinking about the new physics or thinking about the so-called postmodern period but there's always a hole in our in our uh, thinking and in there we like to fill it up with could be with myth or with religion or propaganda or the scientific model can fill that gap. But there are also other things like social theory, which is one of my specializations, social and political theory and debates about that. So I'm tending on this presentation to focus more on this gap part, a kind of the I imaginary space of desire or whatever <coughs> that we, we attempt to complete the picture to make it ours. But also, if we don't interrogate that part, it starts to uh, fill out the other parts. And I see that going on very much, ex especially, for example, the, the discussion about the role of the Mongolians in con contemporary history, right? I still think it has a big, important role, but it fits into a particular story. So I'm going to try <laughs> to do that. My uh, key focus here today on uh, educational research is to get beyond uh, technical and admins, uh, instrumental aspects of learning and organization, which I think is overwhelms a lot of educational research, and they miss the broader picture uh, because of that. It's not that that's important, but we need to do other things also, and that is to look at the institutional and social relations of, of production and reproduction and legitimation uh, outside of schooling processes, 
and contents. And that also means outside of the, let's say, national systems of education that we work within. And so therefore we also have to take into account, and my focus in my work on the geopolitics is kind of interstate, transnational, uh, nomadic localism and, and global dynamics that that influence and impress themselves on schooling processes. And if I have an experience with doing research internationally, for example, one of my close friends, Peter Mayo in Malta, he said one of the key problems with say with Turkish research is always so Turkish centered that you never get a sense of how it's located. And I find the same sense when I read the literature on Ukrainian education. You wouldn't think that Ukraine is located anywhere in the world except in Ukraine. Yeah. And, uh, and this, you see this also in educational research in, in Canada also, but there is a tendency here because it has many <coughs> diasporic <coughs> communities and that to, to focus on these more international relations. So that's one of the key components that I bring here and to look specifically more at post-secondary research within our, our, our cluster here and those two big folks I right now I guess are things that under the jargon of innovation related to science and research and commodification as well as uh, labor market theories on the production of human capital and, and its interrelationships as related to teaching and how do you deliver that. So those are the big, big questions that involve this area of research. And one of my key issues of late is, is what I'm going to call the problem of management, whether we're talking about the Soviet model and the Stalinization of that model in the, in the, in the revolutionary period, Partinovsk emerging within the universities and how that model stays here is something I've also recognized in the neoliberal new model is its implication and imbrication in, in this kind of management ethos where its management is working almost through micro layers to control the process. So in a way I see that as a broad problem and a dynamic or what Max Weber talked about the rationalization of the state. And I think our understandings of the state are somewhat confused in that sense. So I'd like to focus a little bit on that today uh, also. Uh, my key point today, and this is a somewhat of a variation of theme that came out of my previous presentation about a month and a half ago, which was a 35-page paper. So I've taken a different model here with the, with the PowerPoint. But my first point is going to be that Ukraine uh, is a strong nation. And I, I think this is a kind of maybe an inversion of how people have been thinking about it lately. I'm going to say that, that in fact, Ukraine is a strong nation. And if I mean my nation in an imagined community, I think it's part of the historical legacy uh, for Ukrainians that they're a strong nation. And if that's, we're talking about language, religion, culture, mentality, all the different ways <coughs> that we can think about that. And I think it is that the differences are being overstated. That linguistic differences between East and West, North and South are overstated in some way. But these differences are getting greater and they are key instruments in splitting the Ukrainian state, the territory of Ukraine. I see that as a, pr as a problem. And so we could be focusing how to make culture stronger but I think Ukraine has a history of having strong artistic, intellectual, uh, educated classes, even if they didn't have schooling and credentials. And that long culture to me is the basis. And what's missing for those classes are the instruments by which they can direct their power. So that leads to my second key thesis, is that Ukraine is a weak state. So, I want, so I'm talking about strong management within the weak state, but it's a weak state. And what I mean by a weak state is a weak state is easily captured by internal forces outside of it or internationally. So for example, the oligarchs, or could be clan or network relations, capture the state in weak states. Greek is in, Greece is an example of a very weak state, maybe as weak or weaker than uh, Ukraine. United States is actually considered according to the parameters of its ability to have controlled access autonomy from the civil society organizations. Um, private corporate capital, or clans or clan-like networks, or broad transnational forces that have a high influence on the American state. Um, and, and so a large part of thinking about a weak state is that it has, 
low public authority and low public autonomy. It can't act independently. And I'm say, saying here that the state, in fact, is weak. It can't act autonomously on its own against these other forces. These other forces, in fact, capture the state. And so part of that, too, is lack of ability to control the territory on which you're attempting to control. And of course, one of the key issues comes out of a weak state is non-compliance to law. So you run into the problems uh, uh, about how do you make a law that works, that people will follow. And I would call it like pushing a rope. It's like, I can imagine, it's like pushing a rope. You can spend all this time making law and it doesn't make a difference. So, so in that sense, policy starts to function more as legitimation than it does as regulation or construction of a new order. And in that sense, it's quite different, let's say, than in Germany, which is, I would consider, a strong state. Uh, China as a strong state. So as a case in point here, I think, we'd have to look to the next level of the specificity, specificity of Ukraine and its being a weak socioeconomic order, but having strong but fragmented economic resources. So I think the issue of fragmentation is an important one. And because of that, you see these relations of dependency <coughs> emerging through it. And I would compare uh, as a strong state opposite would be South Korea. Uh, Canada is another example very much like South Korea which has a dependent development in relationship to the United States but has positive development. Canada, South Korea are countries which are highly dependent going against dependency theory but therefore have a lot of wealth. And so sometimes dependency creates wealth but some, a lot of times dependency just there's an extraction of the wealth. So that's my third key point on this. That a strategy that maybe looks at what South Korea does would be a valuable point rather than moving to align with another imperial movement. So if we look at the title here, I've mentioned that I've had historical in it, but I'm really not looking at the historical in a specific empirical way. I'm looking at historical more as the myth of the history of Ukraine and how it aligns with other places, as well as what I'm going to call, be careful that you don't substitute one colonial model for another one. And I think that's the risk. I would agree with the, the <coughs> critiques about the emergence of a certain kind of mentality that is a slave mentality, which is, they used to say that the Byzantine religions were the perfect ideology for slaves. But so there's a certain history of a certain orientation. But in terms of substituting one model for the other, be careful that we don't move from the Soviet factory model to the American Walmart model, which is what we're experiencing here in North America, that there's a revolution going on in universities at the same time. So in some ways, Ukraine is experiencing a multiple revolution in the university system, and it has certain effects. In looking at this, I would emphasize, let's see if I can get this going right. That we have to look at, this is from uh, Keith Vanderpeel. He's a regulation theorist. I like regulation theorists because they argue also that the state is the primary form of agency in any society. But anyway, by locating the state you have to identify also its relationship and embeddedness in the na natural order, the, the ecology of the place, where the rivers are, where the mountains are, uh, where the resources are. You have to look at ethnogenesis, that is the building of a community in the history of language, which is very important for the study of Ukraine, as well as class relations, which I think has fallen off the map, except maybe talking about oligarchs a bit. Um, it was, uh, it was good to hear from Anatoly talking about you know, some of the class relations of the billionaires, and it's important how many billionaires you have in a country, but also those class relations as they play themselves out in relationship to ethnogenesis and the form of the state. Usually when we talk about relations of production, right away we think about Marxism, and I'm aware of the way Marxism is understood 
in Eastern Europe and as my work in Poland has identified, just even to use the word Marxism itself brings with that whole mythology that it's very difficult. But I like to think about more in terms of a critical humanist analysis, aside from uh, Marxist-Leninism and, uh, and Stalinist forms of, of analysis, but we need to look at the relations of production but that's not just Marxism, there's also a whole area of Marxism that looks at foreign relations and the role of different kinds of identities and formations. And that's why I like Keith van der Peel's work because he incorporates that into his analysis more in keeping with my, what might be a Weberian kind of analysis. So when we look at foreign relations, we have to also incorporate into our analysis uh, clan relations whether they are the old kind of clan relations or the new fictive clan relations, which are very important still in Ukraine. And a lot of these things, if we go to the work of Deleuze, for example, kinship relations have a lot of power for people, especially, let's say, within indigenous communities, in resisting the state. So there's a whole set of activities that emerge outside of the state and are resistant to the state, but nevertheless are very important within clan relations. And if we think about how the mafia functions, I think that's a good sense of how clan relations could continue to live on while the state is having kind of its sovereign laws produced. Other laws at the very micro level of clan relations are also produced. And we also have the, the, the notion of the nation state, which we can't ignore, of sovereign equality and laws that they need to be looked at, as well as global governance. And global governance is a very interesting phenomenon right now, what uh, Cox calls the nebulous, a whole series of uh, multi-international relations of people, let's say, working through the OECD and talking to each other and developing dynamics, again, outside of law but being very influential in the shaping the way universities function today. So I know I don't have time to go through all the details on this, but I had the, the function to identify these kind of conceptual uh, apparatuses that we need to do. This is how I look at it. I'm not saying other people should look at it that way. Uh, but I think we need to look <coughs> at it in multiple ways. And again, we don't all have to be looking at it the same way to try to get a sense of the multi-perspectives about what's going on. But we need to do more than just assume a certain conceptual order that's given to us without thought. And this reflects back to what is a learning society, what is a learning institution, how does the university function as a place that doesn't reproduce some of those orders, and one of them is to open up the possibilities of multiple contestations. And I want to talk a bit about that today. What's clearly at the depth of some of the analyses that I do is one is the notion of the, the subject. The subject as a historical subject, and in this case maybe even the Ukrainian state as the subject with or without agency. And with this comes the post-colonial critiques uh, that uh, Anatoly talked about. I think the post-colonial analysis is very <coughs> important. How Ukraine is a colony and we have colonial mentalities. And I was raised with a colonial mentality, I know exactly what it is. And when you grow up in Western Canada, you can't help but assimilate that also. So it's a very difficult thing, but it's important to look at. One is also to look at the ethnological aspects, which is very much overlooked, but in issues of ethnology, uh, related to religion, folk ways, uh, language. And, and I think if there was a weakness with a lot of the research uh, on Ukraine is that it overemphasizes the ethnological component while not looking at, uh, let's say, the theory of the subject or what I'm going to focus on, regulation theory. That I would recommend the work, say, of, uh, of Bob Jessup and our uh, critical cultural political economy, which is a very important concept that we're developing. And I would like to recommend that you take a look at Roman Patrician's work that he's been looking at inclusive education, where he's identifying how to integrate many of these concepts at the different levels to identify, let's say, in his a comparison of Crimea and Ukraine, which is a forthcoming publication he's working on. So my own work has taken me to look at the broad dynamics of uh, Russia, Turkey, and the EU, and that triangulation of relationships, but that's more broadly situated within the relationships with the United States. And the United States functions at an empire level in this sense, is that it has established in the post-World War II period the major infrastructure 
for uh, the world, whether it's the IMF, the World Bank, and even the sub-institutions like the OECD. This is one way the Americans function by establishing a certain American culture uh, that permeates all the institutions, in including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we have to be aware of that. But we, the U.S. also functions as a nation state with particular interests, particular military power, and a particular emphasis on what it wants to do, and in rela close relationship to the EU and Japan as a key triangulating power globally. Then, of course, you have these emerging nations like Russia, India, China, Brazil, the BRIC countries. And these are very important to analyze. They kind of form a second tier of multipolarity. So we're not living in a multipolar world. We're still living in with one superpower. <coughs> but these other po polarities make for very intriguing dynamics. And they make for very intriguing dynamics in the three countries I'm studying. Greece, Turkey, and Ukraine. Each has its own colonial relationship. Ukraine in the Russian orbit, Greece in the European orbit, and for <coughs> Turkey, its subgroup, the Kurds, which is really directing a lot of the attention for the, uh, the Turkish government at the moment. And if you wonder well, how they're having a revolution there, I would say as significant as what went on in Iran after 1979. They have purged about 100,000 people in the last two or three months from universities, from the courts, from the police, from the schools. And they've appointed rectors at all the universities and they're in a way moving the opposite direction that Ukrainians are talking about moving toward. They're getting rid of the autonomy and the democratic elements of the autonomous university systems, kind of based on the French slash Germanic model, and uh, implementing a very dictatorial model where, in fact, the president, Erdogan, appoints people to each university. So it's still in conflict, but there's how you make a change. Of course, it's going to be more neoconservative based on the Muslim Brotherhood ideology and uh, a really big <coughs> challenge to secularism. So that's kind of what's going on in Turkey, and a lot of this is justified by denying minority rights to a lot of different groups, but primarily the Kurds. And so I think looking at this dy dynamic within the Black Sea allows us to get a sense of the positioning of <coughs> Ukraine in relationship to the regional politics that are going on and changing, as well as the more uh, imperial politics of the EU and the United States. And I would agree with the previous speakers very much that lots of change in policy, but who knows where it's going to go and how it's going to go, but there have been changes that might be coming at the more lower level. And at the other hand, there is a colonial response in the sense of not doing it for oneself. Uh, I think this is, this is clear. <coughs> So in looking more broadly at the model, we can see that uh, we can look at different aspects of foreign relations. And uh, I don't want to go into too much detail on this. This is the organizing chart. But mode of foreign relations includes looking at tribal relations, empire and nomadic relations, sovereign equality, and global governance in different areas that I put on the original chart. But I want to get to the original dynamics because it's more empirical in terms of how I've explored this. So in, ter in terms of forming and comparing these three areas, I would talk about uh, Ukraine and Euromadan as uh, <coughs> Russian <coughs> occupation and war. Just a summary, in, in Turkey after post Gezi Park and the Arab, this following Arab Spring, not really part of Arab Spring because Turkey is not Arabic, uh, I call it neoconservative authoritarian backlash. And in Greece, uh, with Syriza and what's going on in the government, you have, I'm going to call EU stalemate and democratic optimism. And Greece is very interesting in terms of its colonial legacy. And when you talk to Greeks about problems and how to change their education system, I was talking to Roman, the priests more or less still run Greek education. I mean, they were thrown out of Ukraine, uh, Western Ukraine anyways, in the mid-19th century, uh, 
And after the Soviet Revolution, for sure, the priests are not involved, but they are actually state employees and they run a confessional kind of education system without collecting any data about it whatsoever. But anyway, if you talk about what's going on in Greece and how you would change it, the explanation that Greeks will give me is the Ottoman legacy. So that's 500 years of colonial domination by the Ottoman Empire of the Greeks. They had a revolution almost 200 years ago, yet still that's the cause. So we have to be very careful when we use something like the Soviet legacy as a constant <coughs> explanation for why we can't do things. The Greeks have a very good example. On the other hand, if you show Greeks how to do something that's different, they say, not Greek. <laughs> So it doesn't taste Greek, it doesn't sound Greek, then we're not going to do it. And so if you look at the kind of changes that are going to be brought about in, in response uh, to the changes that are required to go on in Greece, it's going to be very difficult. So we can also look at the eco-geography of these relationships. We can use the terms from the Ottoman Empire, Ak Denise, Syria, Denise, Kurmzid Denise, which is Red Sea, Black Sea, and the Mediterranean was called the White Sea. So this is the, the, the power of those concepts come from looking at that East Mediterranean area and the role that Ukraine plays as a borderland Pontic steppe history. The, the eco-geology of Ukraine is very important to understand mm -hmm. how difficult it is to break with the colonial legacies of any sort just because of that the, the Great Plains there. Istanbul, returning to Istanbul, one of the reasons I went there is Napoleon said if there was to be a capital of the world, it would be Istanbul, right? And then there was the Russian Revolution. And of course, Istanbul was no longer the center, of the world, but it is now, again, at the axis of north, south, east, and west. And of course, Greece plays that traditional role of guardian of the Dar Dardanelles. Then you have, uh, Going back to the broad history, <coughs> we have the, what I'm going to call the accidental nation. Ukraine is the accidental nation from, I think, Wilson's book. He might have be copying from one of Wilson's early books on Ukraine. Um, Kiev and Rus split. And that history plays very important in the kind of narratives that different people try to tell themselves about where they are in the world. Uh, both Russia and Ukraine claiming Kiev, right, as its starting point. Uh, Turks are different. Uh, they're conquering Central Asian warriors. There's no discussion, uh, we were the first occupants, we're on the land of Treaty 6 or 8 or 10. It doesn't really matter to the Turks, they came in and they conquered, kind of like the Americans did. We don't care, we just conquered you, that's why we won. So the, the justifications and legitimations of the big stories for the Turks are quite different. And of course from Greece, uh, it's the myth center for the West. And of course, if you look at the West, it's actually Greece that's not really influenced it that much. It's the Roman Empire. Uh, Greece did influence Ukraine and Russia with the Byzantine Church. And Turks just claim that the Greeks came after them, right? So they each have a different narrative on how that Byzantine relationship <laughs> is played out. And it structures at a very deep level what I'm going to call this gap. So, in looking at the three countries in terms of class and capital relationships, I would identify in terms of labor, uh, the term uh, drawn from Selenye that uh, Ukraine or Eastern uh, Slavic peoples are now ruled by capitalists without capitalism, I still think that stands, and a kind of labor serfdom. Uh, in Turkey, you get a classic class struggle of rep and repression, with, uh, but the eyes are on Greece and conflicted, and, and there's a conflicted and moribund left there. That's quite, quite common. Uh, Greece itself has mass populism and mobilization, but elected government that really is not responding or can respond to austerity. And if you look at the Greek left, uh, they're not moribund, they're just fragmented. There are at least three major parties and three uh, uh, movements, and they all don't talk to each other because they have their own style and ego identity. In terms of property, uh, classically a struggle in Ukraine, uh, this is from Wilson, between billionaires and millionaires. What was going on through the, the revolutionary period of the Orange Revolution and Yoramadan, the role of millionaires and billionaires. These are the agents 
of democracy. Uh, and classic statement, uh, no bourgeoisie, no democracy. So the, you do need a bourgeoisie that's acting really strongly to develop a basis for some kind of uh, brokerage of exchange, I would say. In Turkey, the rise, you get the rise of the Anatolian bourgeoisie, that's in the central part of Turkey. They are the carriers of the new religious sentiment. Uh, it's primacy of merchant capital, if you control that, that's Istanbul, the big, the billionaires in Istanbul control trade. If it's a trade in educational commodities, they want to control it. If it's in any other kind of goods, they control it and they still do. They're still dominating. And then of course there's the bureaucratic kinfolk. You have to be linked into kin relations to get ruling decisions to go your way. So if the rules fit with your kin, then the rules are applied. When the rules don't fit to your kin, that's okay, you can get away with that. And that might sound familiar. That's when policy does play a role. I notice that more and more in our universities, that the policies only make a difference if you have someone in a position of power to legislate it. But if you don't have power, the rule can become overridden with an exception, a demand. We, could, we have to do it because the market demands us to do this, right? And, and so power starts to play its role in the networks. And, and that's like Castell's famous book, The Network Society. What's another way of saying that's the corrupt clan relations, in a sense, compared to state legitimacy. No public authority because the rules can be bent depending on the position in power. So you wait for a person to have a, that you can depend on to bring the law about for you. And who do you apply the laws to and rules? To people that you're competing with. They have to follow the rules, but you don't. And of course in Greece you have a merchant comprador class and a bourgeois paradise. And that's what I would say, that in Greece, Greece is continually, if you look at its history, the object of another imperial power, whether it's Britain, Russia, if you look at what happened during the Syriza conflict a couple of years ago, it was there, it was, it was unfolding. They were waiting for Russia to give money, but Russia wasn't going to give money. They waited for China to give money. And when they couldn't get money from China or Russia, they couldn't go anywhere. So they were back with the Americans and the British. And so what's interesting, Ukrainians are looking somewhat towards someone to step in to provide them with the money so that they can do something and that becoming in some ways debt bound to implement policies that might not be good for Ukraine because the debt has to be met. And so the austerity agenda could be one of the downsides be by going too neoliberal into Ukraine. You get new mechanisms of organization from the West, but you also have that debt servicing that will drive everything else. And that's what's happening to Greece right now. In terms of foreign relations, we can look at uh, global governance in all of them. The relationship between American empire of civil society. And I use the term American empire of civil society from Rosenberg. And Rosenberg talks about the power of American imperialism isn't the American state. It's its NGOs. It's the non-government institutions that have the power. And that's what Putin very well understood is when he shut out American NGOs in Russia. Because he knows that's how the, the, the Americans assert themselves, through their corporations, through their organizations that are not state. If they need the state, they'll bring the state in. And one of the terms I liked and I heard once, the only difference between Bush and Obama is that Obama will talk to you before he bombs you. <laughs> All right. So they always have that power, that military power to bring it in. And now with Trump being elected, I think if you, I was thinking about how would I answer this question, how about after Trump? I don't know. I think it's, it's very difficult. I do think that what will happen is that the last presentation I talked about if Hillary Clinton came, it will still be a bonanza for universities and soft power into Ukraine. I don't think I can say that now. I don't know if, if we're back to using hard power again in that area of the world. And I don't think that would be very good news, neither for universities nor uh, for the Ukrainians, because they are in that borderland region. But anyway, that's the civil society and then the relationship between hard power and soft power we have to look at always. And I think there's been a major shift with Trump coming in 
The second thing in terms of foreign relations, we have to focus on this kind of sub-state relations, whether it's empires, nomadic clan tribes, borderland, and this has a long history. And uh, I think if you look at how Ukraine responded in the post-Soviet period, in those initial decades when people started to make relations again and try to find a way to fund their lives, they re-established a lot of networks that are still active today. And, uh, and I think those need to be analyzed and how are they working and how are they affecting what's going on in our universities. So in terms of sovereign space, I would say the key uniqueness of Ukraine is it's between East and West. Uh, the term that I use uh, for the uh, rump empire of Turkey is that after Ataturk came in, it says Turkey will be consolidated and all the Ottomans came back to Turkey and they were from all the different other cultures also and uh, they were non-imperialistic. That has shifted, but that was the sovereign space. Turkey is a solid space and why they don't want Kurdish expansion, could it, it could fragment the state. And uh, Greece, again, I already mentioned about its Ottoman legacy as the excuse for everything that doesn't go right, rather than Greeks saying, well, maybe there's something we're not quite doing here that we can do. Uh, we can blame the uh, Ottomans who haven't been around for 200 years. In terms of protection, which is an important part of state protection, the debate, little Russians or little Europeans. I mean, so if you're, you know, we're Ukrainian, we're not little Russians. Well, are you little Europeans? And it was a term I used in the last presentation a couple of months ago when I talked about, when I talked to Turks, it says, are you Eastern, are you Western? And the Turks would say, we're Turkish. But for Ukrainians, it always seems important when I talk, if you're from the East, more, oh, I'm more Russian. If I'm from the West, oh, I'm more Western. And I think this, this logic gets in, is one of those things that gets in the way from actually exploring what's happening. And that's, identity is important, of course. So if we talk about nationalisms arising out of those kind of identities, it's a kind of weak nationalism if you have to define yourself in terms of others. And of course, that's a colonial mentality. I would put it in that category of being colonialized. And of course, if we look at Greece, <coughs> it has a, it's always been dominated by a foreign power. It's submissive to the US, UK, Germany. Uh, and if you look at the history of the, of, of the Greeks right from the beginning of their revolutions in 1820 and 1830, it was the foreign powers. When Lord Byron was roaming around Greece writing poetry, he was there for a reason. He was representing the British government and providing funding for the revolutionaries to escape the Roman, the Ottoman Empire. Um, in terms of exchange, the EU IMF push into the Russian orbit. I mean, that's the clear financial side of it, and it's it's a legacy. I don't know how Ukraine is going to extricate itself from this financial burdens that they have taken on. Um, of course, Turkey is the rising star between east, west, north, and south, and it is continuously uh, emerging as a neo-Ottoman enterprise. And uh, I think after this recent purges, Erdogan has relatively singled, signaled that we're not with the EU. You could pick that up five years ago, that the EU wasn't going to happen. Uh, but that's not good news for the secularist and the Western-oriented people, which is primarily all the universities. Uh, really bad news for what's going to happen to them. And of course in Greece you have the European Troika uh, versus how will they play the different orbits. I think it's important to go still to ethnology and look at some things that sometimes always aren't looked at. Um, in Ukraine, for example, around ra race relations, I still think Ukrainians are seen as non-Western, non-white, kind of, I'm going to put the term, off-white people. They don't really quite fit. And uh, I think Southern uh, Eastern Europeans, like the Greeks and the Balkans people, fit that same category also. They're not quite seen as European. And I think there's a level of racism with that. Of course, Turkey is clearly considered brown, and Greece is considered white, which is fascinating in terms of those broader discourses. I think we need to also look at the relationships of patriarchy. We don't see that talked about very often, but I would classify all three countries as highly patriarchal. Um, uh, and I don't know what we're going to do about that. Maybe have women talk more about men 
controlling the situation. I don't know, it's a big difficulty in, in Canada, but I think it's a little less patriarchal. In terms of fi uh, folkways, uh, European or Eurasian, but not Western. I think this is really interesting because uh, if you work even at this university for a while and you ask of them people about Ukraine <coughs> or Russia or even Poland, they don't they don't know really how to categorize it. They don't know whether it's this they they kind of know it's European. They might say East European, but they don't really think of it as Western. But I don't think a lot of Ukrainians think of it that way. Um, and I think Olenka's nodding away here. You've experienced this, I'm sure. Like it's kind of an empty zone here in Canada. Why? And in Edmonton, which has a l huge diasporic community, you have this. And uh, I think it's a, there's a kind of racialized notion of of Eastern Europe that ties into kind of where does it actually fit? Is it in? It's and so that notion of the barbarian culture is still, I think, endemic to it as it's seen in the West, at least the Anglo-Saxon West. Uh, Turkish is seen as hybridic in some ways and themselves see themselves as hybridic. And the Greeks are interesting too. You go to Greece and you work there and you just see clearly this is not part of the West, but yet it's so, so clearly the Greeks are part of the, the mythical narrative of the West. And they've internalized that themselves. And everything that was ever of importance was invented by the Greeks. <laughs> and and you try to tell them, well, that's just because Greek words were used on everything, so you didn't invent them. But I don't know if they're any better than the Russians who built everything and bigger than everybody else also. So I think there are these kind of broad generalizations we can sometimes make. In terms of minority politics, I think, I, to tie to the point that I'm making, I think that Ukraine is informed more by a tyranny of little differences. Ethnic and linguistic differences between Ukrainian and Russian has increased because the imperial partition is possible. Whether it's from NATO or whether it's from the Russians, the fact that NATO has troops or Canadian troops on the Zabruch River is not by accident, I don't think. And we know about the Russians. And so this in-betweenness makes those small differences very important to imperial powers because they like to work those differences and I think we can see that happening and so I think we are attending to those differences but we may be contributing to the differences and uh, I mean early discussions were more about federation and then when people start to talk about separation when they say don't talk about civil war then th these are the signs that people are aware that that these are potentialities because of being in between and Turkey, the split is between ethnic and civic Turks, but strong sense of Turkish identity in a post-Kemalist socialization. Kemalism is an authoritarian liberalism. That's kind of the ruling ideology, at least for most of the 21st century, 20th century. But in the 21st century, you have this rising neo-Ottoman, uh, neo-Turkish, neo- -Turkish, neo uh, uh, religious orientation that is not really Islamicist uh, and it's not really liberal in its Islam it's kind of like what they have in in Egypt the Muslim Brotherhood that Erdogan has picked upon and so it's a it's an interesting conservative position but minority politics have always been a big challenge in Turkey uh, especially with the Jewish Armenian <coughs> and Greek historical expropriations and the violence there uh, as well as the failure of the Turks to, to identify the Armenian genocide. Uh, but the big issue is, of course, the counter coup that came about, and that's been gone not against the Gulenists who are identified as part of the problem, but against the secularists and the socialists. And that's what's happening in the purges now, because these people are being included. So secularism is really a difficult issue. As well, the PKK, which is the military arm of the Kurds, and identified as a terrorist organization, but the HDP was a purely democratic multiculturalist party, and its leader was just recently thrown in jail. So that's a really uh, difficult situation for minorities. In Greece, uh, Greek blood and soil citizenship is very strong, strong much stronger than the <coughs> Germans. You can't be Greek unless you have the blood. Um, and foreign workers, or there's a deep racist discourse, and everyone is identified as the Turks 
as the colonial aftermath, but the Turks is just the outsider coming in, and uh, mainly they're Albanians, uh, so they're both Muslim or converted from Islam, uh, and ethnically and uh, racially a little bit distinctive, and so you see that. And uh, I think in, in terms of Ukraine, there is a, a dynamic in terms that we haven't seen of the kind of nationalism the literature tends to show that there's an emerging new kind of civic nationalism emerging. But my sense also there is a stronger uh, ultra nationalism which is very dangerous because it can evoke the backlashes and it may not produce the kind of outcomes that people intend them to be. But I think uh, Ukrainians do need a strong sense of the nationalism. but. They don't have the state in which to make it happen, which would be through, let's say, educational institutions. Um, finally, uh, or secondly, we get uh, religion. So I think in Ukraine, you actually have a, 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 a large secular population, if I look at the statistics anyway, as a product, I guess, of the, of the Soviet Revolution. Uh, you get the uh, Czech Republic is another, China is also, I think uh, communist revolutions are, are, are promoting secularism. So, th so the, the return to religion and the competing orthodox religions is, is maybe uh, more superficial than is first represented, but I don't know, I'm not a researcher in that area. I would go to someone who is an expert and rather than making those claims. In Turkey, of course, the, the, the strike with the secular state with the large secular minority influencing judiciary military, university, Istanbul, business elites, and now are threatening the, dem the democracy that's there. Uh, and, but it's a resurgent Islam, basically Hanafi Sunni, one ver version of, of, of Sunni Islam, and, and very restrictive to the Alevis, which is uh, a Shia group uh, in Turkey. And then finally, in Greece, you have Greek Orthodox, or 97% includes confessional dominance in education and folkways. It's really phenomenal. Sometimes it's ranked below Saudi Arabia in terms of its confessional power. So if you're outside of that group, blood and religion, you're really a, a complete outsider. And one of the researchers in, in Greece told me, it's not so much that Greeks don't take care of foreigners as much, they have the hospitality, they just don't take care of Greeks either. So that's, that's interesting how that dynamic works. Now in terms of the state, worst case scenario for Ukraine, it's always bothered me. I've talked to Bogdan about this, and, uh, but the strong internal Soviet state <coughs> legacy, which people talk about, the weak state submissiveness, and also with the potential for a Bosnia scenario. And if you haven't studied Bosnia, you should, because uh, Bosnia was a way that the Americans kept Germany out of Yugos former Yugoslavia. Interesting politics there. So the, the Yugoslavs are very interesting to study about how these differences uh, turn genocidal, and we wouldn't want to see that happen. And that's why I define, in terms of the Bologna Agreement on Universities, is it another bridge too far? I think it is a bridge too far. But what's very interesting, and why I referred to Roman's work, is that a lot of changes that can occur can occur at the non-sovereign level. That just because you, you don't have sovereign interactions, there can be a lot of organizational changes in his research on human rights and inclusive education and comparing Crimea and, uh, and Ukraine and its differences shows that there are lots of fundamental changes. Now those changes will not continue without the changes in sovereign power that are required to maintain the infrastructure that allows for that. But in those different areas, there can be a lot of changes. It's a kind of the upside in my thinking about this that I call the downside at North American universities, where I think a lot of the changes here are also escaping popular sovereignty. So if you have department councils or governments uh, making decisions, they're not really followed because the changes are made at the organizational level through management uh, reorganization. And then with Turkey, of course, uh, you've got a strong liberal authoritarian state, uh, which is now resistant uh, to the US, whereas before it was more proxy. And uh, you have many of the dynamics I've already mentioned, and it's now looking eastward. And in terms of Greek, the weak confessional state, uh, clan clientelism, I would say, is stronger there than anything. And uh, legislation and policy is not really binding on anyone. 
Now, the rest of the uh, paper you have access to, I think, from the, at least the PowerPoint of it, it deals with the, the, uh, the differences in Ukraine specifically, which I haven't touched on. And I think our other speakers have done a really good job on the policy side. And if you read uh, Anatoly's work on, I would cite it here, on looking at the changes with the high-level research universities are very good, good works on, the, on that basis. But I want to talk here about one point to just kind of wrap up. I don't see which one. Is that what I see emerging if we look at the history of the Let's go right to the end. In terms of the history of the state in the U.S., I like uh, Ernst, Ernst Gellner's work on the state. He's a Weberian, and his key theme is uh, that states, states use nationalism to make nations. States use nationalism to make nations. Another way to think about it is a nation is an ethnicity with an army. <laughs> Nations are ethnicities with an army. Now it's a different way of looking at the nature of nationalism and its emergence. Um, what he's saying here, yes you can have these uh, ethnological remnants and pieces, right? But you need to put them together in strong ways. And to do that you need instruments, and those instruments are instruments of the state, primarily the education systems. And those education systems have to have a strong cohort of intelligentsia that can assert their will. And I think what we're seeing in Ukraine is in fact, in what I heard confirmed even today in the discussion, is that we see an intelligentsia on the run. I see that here in North America, but we have people who are telling us what to do as teachers, educators, researchers, thinkers, talkers, and we know what we do. That's what we got a PhD to do. That's why I took 24 years of schooling to even get a job so I could be trusted with that space. But in that space, I have corporate executives telling me what I should do. I have leading bureaucrats and administrators telling me what to do. I have students telling me what to do. Everyone can tell me what to do in the area of education. <coughs> I find that interesting, to say the least, let alone insulting, oppressive, distrustful, disloyal. I would never think to go into an administrator's office and tell them how to balance the books. I don't do that. I don't care about that. I don't go into a corporate executive and tell them how to manage. But this inversion that has gone on, I think, is something that's facing uh, the intelligentsia and educated groups of people around the world. And it's in within different systems. That's what I find interesting. It's not, in, it's, I hear this commonly again and again. And it ties to the very fact how you mentioned that this, they managed to pay their professors a little bit more in another country that just is corrupt. But, but education is somehow important. I know for uh, Ukraine, and Ukrainians, uh, education has always been central of importance, that to know things, to have a, a historical memory, to tell stories, has always been important in itself. And the people who usually did that didn't do it for the money, and they didn't do it for the promotion. They did it to be able to do that, but it was highly respected. And it was one of the reasons, when I first went to Turkey, that I liked working in Turkey. It was one of the reasons I liked working in South Korea, and I think it'll be one of the reasons I will like working more in Ukraine, is that there is a respect for mind work. That it's okay in Turkey 
to sit on the corner and smoke a cigarette and someone will come to you and they say, what are you doing? And they will say, I'm sitting. And that's okay. <laughs> they're sitting and they're thinking. And that's okay. That we don't always have to be running around. And that's what I really noticed the big change in the neoliberal university. And I would hate to work in the factory university, <laughs> all for the same reasons, is that the one thing you're not allowed to say you're doing is sitting. Or thinking. Or thinking. <laughs> and so I think I want to end with that, on that notion, is that the people who do those things need to have instruments that protect them and allow them to assert that, at least in equal form with the bureaucrats and with the corporatists. I think that's an important thing. So there's a poli deep political question here in terms of what and where the change will come from. Because we have seen it's not necessarily going to come from the students, but maybe it will come from us. Okay, thank you. My question about, about how you've laid out the ideas relating these three jurisdictions is what do you see as the primary tools emerging that actually change things? Because what you've provided is a kind of um, a connectivity of ideas, but not a statement about which instruments in which cases actually change things. So observing the Turkish um, leadership change is an observation, not um, not a speculation, not a model that says, "Here's what you have to do to move in any direction." Okay. Any other, oh, Roman? Uh, yes, I, uh, one of the messages I got from the presentation was this notion that Ukraine has a choice; it finds itself uh, being quartered from from certain Western countries. Uh, it finds itself uh, from its uh, pathway of dependency, from its history, from Russia and so on. So uh, uh, maybe another way of asking the same question, that is, <coughs> uh, given this choice, um, should we be looking to um, the economic system, the emerging economic system, the nature of the emerging capitalist system in Ukraine, as distinct from uh, former the former command economy of the Soviet Union, or uh, for sure we, uh, unlike Turkey, we will not be looking to the Ukrainian army because it, it, the Ukraine mm -hmm. does not have a tradition of the military governing mm -hmm. education or changing the society. Or sh uh, should we indeed? Some uh, you've said that not to look to students and. Uh, but perhaps to look at the intelligentsia, which puts us somewhere back in the uh, mid-19th century mm -hmm. again, uh, the Ukrainian population mm -hmm. looking to its intelligentsia to do. Mm -hmm. At any rate, uh, same question, what, uh, what forces are at play uh, given the geopolitical context of the Ukrainian society and history? Okay. Don? Uh, Dr. Kashmir, thank you very much. It's very interesting to listen to you, and also the paper was quite insightful. Um, I have two small questions and uh, 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 the comment. Uh, when you uh, define this off whiteness, mm -hmm. defined uh, by whom? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, like, is it self perception of Ukrainians, in your opinion, or where it comes from? Also, uh, this Bosnia scenario, why it's relevant to Ukraine? Could you explain, uh, expand on this? And uh, also, uh, you, uh, you commented about uh, these different fields where everyone's saying what to do. But it's quite a uh, natural uh, way of uh, things. I mean, uh, well, there are different fields where there is power struggle, whether we take yeah. the opinion of Foucault or others. And uh, uh, I, I, I mean, it's important, uh, the culture of dialogue. Uh, to exist and the uh, universities are crucial here and uh, it was interesting to, to see your paper when you where you mentioned Anthony Smith uh, as well mm -hmm. 
with a, as a, a Papa uh, the emphasized the, the role of narrated nation. <laughs> and these narrators, they come from university, <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the main purpose is like uh, uh, to have this dialogue when people say <laughs> what to do, rather than saying this uh, uh, constant approval in this uh, neo-Soviet sty style, as, as was pointed out by Dr. Uh, Alexienko. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's a good thing, is it not? Thank you. And <coughs> we also have one more country in Black Sea region and which recently went through the set of uh, fundamental reforms <laughs> and the education system is uh, among them. It is Georgia. Uh, can you comment on something on this also? I thought you were going to say Bulgaria, but that's okay. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I enjoyed your, your presentation. and. Uh, and you show the value of comparative uh, comparative research. Uh, we uh, don't do it enough, I guess, in, in the histor uh, in the educational field, and or in, in other fields, I suppose. But we should do more, probably, in that regard. I'm curious about uh, the role of reli religion. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned the Weberian uh, mm -hmm. term of rationalization, right. where uh, religion is uh, pretty much about mis. Uh, Mis mystic uh, influence and uh, those happenstances taking mm -hmm. place beyond rational uh, mm -hmm. human uh, intervention, I mean, planning and, and implementation of, of, of mm -hmm. all the work. So how, how does religion come into play? Uh, because I think those three yeah. countries are quite strong in terms of yeah. orthodoxy. Right. Okay, yeah. Hmm. I'm going to start, first of all, with the question of the, uh, Roman's question on the question of choice. Uh, and I think I did identify the tools for change that are not as people seem them to be. One was the state, but this has the pre precursor for that, is that, first of all, I already think we are in a social and political revolution of global proportions. And, and a lot of our responses are conservative responses to those changes. I believe, and the other colleagues who work for me, the scholars at risk, and have identified that we are, especially in North American universities, living through a revolution in the university. How, where it's going, how it's going. So this idea of things are changing are in some ways, there's a structural dynamic to that change that is is in an Althusserian sense overdetermined, that it is happening, and how it's going to play out, uh, I don't know. I think that's what makes this period different than, let's say, the pre Cold War period, where I think things were were not revolutionary in that sense. So, in terms of that revolution, is being generated by uh, new technologies, for example, in the universities and the commodification of those technologies and linking them to the the knowledge based economy. And I think these r dynamics are real, and I think the profits are real, and the payoffs are tremendous for those who tap into it, and the losses are tremendous for those who don't, for example, develop their scientific and technological innovations. And of course, that has tremendous implications for labor, and so it's computerization, pharmaceuticals, uh, bio biotech, all this. I think these are central leading changes that are driving a lot of the change. So there's this technological component to the change. Um, there is a financial component to the change, and that's why the debt and, and servicing debt, there are only two ways that states can collect money, taxes or debt. And so the f neoliberal flip is to no longer collect taxes, but governments pay by for things by debt. And that debt has, and there are a whole series of people with PhDs in that who are studying how to manipulate people by using incentives like debt and paying off the debt. It's called behavioral economics. It's a whole field. So there's complexity theory and behavioral economics. And there are people who actively work, let's say, for example, how do you get people to stop smoking? and the whole strategy behind that. And so it's a different way of manipulating 
people. <coughs> so using finance, the whole process of financialization, and before you financialize things, you have to price them. Before you price them, you have to rationalize them in certain economic ways, and you have to quantify them, and so that ties into a lot of things going on in the accountability agenda tied to financing. So that's a very important instrument of, of change, of force. Then you have what I'm going to call very powerful people as activist administrators. They're not just administrators in the old-fashioned way. They know they are coming in as change agents, and they're called leaders. So there's a whole di the discourse about leaders, as if there are no bosses anymore. Yeah. No managers, no bosses, they're just leaders making at our university's presidents one million plus dollars. And then you have this logic type. So you need well-placed activist administrators and those, there's a, a vying for those positions within the new bureaucracies that are emerging in the new university. Of course, they're going to come into conflict with the old kinds of bureaucracies in the other countries. They see that in Turkey, and one of the ways they did it was just fire all the rectors, but they still have the same system. They don't have the new model that's coming in. Uh, the model that will be in Ukraine, I don't know. It will be a mix of this and that, depending on uh, influence of the Canadian universities like U of A on them. So there's that part. And I think there's a shift, uh, there's a new, intelli uh, a new ideology that has emerged, and as I call the happiness agenda. As long as you're happy, you can be stupid, but happy you can't be, all right? You have to be happy. Happiness is the most, it's the indicator. There are even indicators being developed for happiness agenda. So I don't know how that's going to play out, but the, <coughs> the old ideas of the enlightenment or critical scholarship, or all, they, they seem to be not as important anymore. So there's an ideological shift, a financial shift, an administrative shift, and a technological shift. And these are generating the revolution. And at each, at, at each moment that you intersect with it, you can do something otherwise. When students ask me, what can I do, Dr. Kutcher? I say, well, just do something different. <laughs> it's hard, though. It's really hard to do something different because there are penalties to it. But I think that's the choice. I think how uh, that is played out is then product of that history that history uh, and also the military resources and a whole range of things come into play to be able to assert the choice you want to make. And a lot of people get past that point. And so I think then we're into social psychology, self-perception. So that's, that's different. The primary tools of change, I think they're, they're, they're more bureaucratic, they're more elitist, and it's about people who understand where and when and so you may be seeing in the emergence of what might be called a progressive uh, bureaucrat. Uh, uh, people like Sunstein who worked for Obama, they used Friedman's idea of choice, but they said we don't have to do it towards neoliberal notions of profitability. We can direct our cafeteria model of nudging people this way and that way in more progressive ways. But we can't tell the people that we're doing it to them. And that's what I call neo-authoritarianism. They're, they're doing this stuff to us, but they can't tell us. They can't even tell leading administrators that they're doing it. They're just saying, we're going to put these new instruments in place, the financial instruments, the technology instruments, and the incentives, and we'll just see what happens. And then they have consultancies, and they have their strategic meetings. But nevertheless, there are people in leading positions that are looking at the new model of using marketization, for example, to produce alternative outcomes than just merely profit making. Now whether they can do it or not, I don't, I don't know. And we saw the result of this is also Trump coming to the fruition where ideas <coughs> and discourse become even less important because these instruments of control are more important. But I'm not so confident that there will be these progressive bureaucrats emerging. So I go to the one subsections of the intelligentsia which are people like us that actually do spend the time thinking about these things and, and how it works. So the, the short question of primary tools for change <coughs> right now, other than going with the flow, which is, which I say it's going to change whether you, you try to change it or not personally or even sometimes collectively, I don't know. I don't really know that answer to that. I can't promote whether this is going to be the agent. And I sometimes don't even know whether change is such a good thing. Maybe stop doing things. 
just stop doing things. Stop doing it. When someone says, you know, there's a new book out on the go slow professor. But what are the, the price you pay? You pay a big price for going slow, but maybe you just go slow. That's a personal choice. Collective choices, I don't know. I don't see anything on the horizon that is a mobilization of people or whatever that seem to know what they're doing. That I say, yeah, I would like to get on board with that and do that. I'm, I'm not <coughs> cynical in that sense. I, I see even our presenters today are, are pragmatically realistic about what the possibilities are. And when I look at those practical things, I'd say, no, but at the same time, they're not going to be gung ho with the changes that are coming about. Uh, like there's so much fashionable thing to just get on board. The, what uh, has been called sometimes in Canada mandatory enthusiasm mm -hmm. that you have to be mandatorily enthusiastic about every change that it's promoting. You say you look at it and say, no, I don't think it's any better. I don't think the new technology coming into my classrooms, for example, are better in terms of the way I evaluate education. I still very old fashioned. One reading, ten people, we talk about it. Uh, I don't know what's so fancy about that. Um, uh, off whites, I don't know. Uh, this uh, issue of racism, uh, self perception, I know it's to me it's based on notions of white supremacy and how different social orders rank themselves. My experience has been that when you look at German race theory, who's at the top? Germans. When you look at American race theory, who's at the top? White Americans. When you look at Russian race theory, who's at the top? Russians. So it seems to be consistent pattern that, that when you have a race theory and hierarchy, you always put yourself at the top and then the ordering is different. I think historically, objectively, we can say uh, uh, there's always been an endemic racism against Ukrainians and they mean there may be that sense even within the East Slavic peoples, the hierarchy of where Ukrainians were, Russian and then Ukrainian. Uh, in Canada, definitely it's there, but it's, it's confused in other ways because definitely uh, Ukrainians have now been assimilated to a category of whiteness in North America. So I would never claim, or Ukrainians don't claim, they're always usually put in that category, but there is a certain othering that goes. So I think it's a complex question that, that I don't know, but I think it's an important one. And remember, racism, you can have races, but racism is a collection of different fragments that that ruling groups who, who, who develop these and use them can find the most finest distinction to make a distinction. So I don't know how that would play out. That would be a major paper. I've been working on one for th two years. I'm still not happy with it. The Bosnia scenario is just that how can an area like in Bosnia where you have Muslims, you have Catholics, you have Orthodox people living in Sarajevo. They are living there. They're quite peaceful. They have a system and it breaks down and they start killing each other. Right? Uh, that's, that's my worry. That's, that's what I would call the, the worst case scenario for Ukraine. That it becomes the new bloodlands. It becomes the next proxy for these imperial uh, adventures. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I can't predict on that. But that's what I call the Bosnia scenario. And it's worth studying because it's very interesting how that developed. There are the precursors and the afters, but that's what I would do. In terms of Georgia, I don't <coughs> know anything about Georgia beyond just superficial claim about it, so I won't say anything. And, uh, and uh, until you said on comparative research, uh, yeah, I think we need to do more comparative research. That's the, the key thesis here. But it's awfully hard to do a presentation, comparative research, because you can't really get to the complete presentation because you have a lot more to do with double the, double the work, right? And if you're translating in another language, then you have a quarter. So if you, I know you've probably experienced that. I have. Uh, religion, yes. I've been looking more at what I call political theology, uh, uh, the post-secular society, uh, the the rise of religion in a, and as well as civic religion, seeing secularism as a form of, of, of civic religion. And, uh, and the idea of the death of God <laughs> is overstated and maybe very Eurocentric in its understanding. So I think uh, the, the, uh, the role of religion and its multiple uh, uh, connotations and how religion is tied both to a kind of salvationist ethic, let's say within Christianity, uh, but also tied to violence. The relationship between religion and violence is a very intriguing one that needs to be uh, explored, as well as the nature and functioning of particular texts. So for example, on the discussion of Islam, I think people are confusing Islam with being Muslim. 
being Muslim is a subjective position of a particular interpretation of, of a sacred doctrine. And so there's a difference between Christianity and Christians. And so you can have many variations on the interpretations, uh, but uh, you also have uh, uh, specific texts that exist and say certain things, either about women or about genocide, or how do you treat somebody else, and they, they can be either ignored or they can be uh, utilized, uh, but nevertheless they exist, right? And I think the distinction between the subjective and the objective is a big problem there. But I think if, in terms of rationalization, I think that there's a certain way to rethink not just the role of the state, but also the role of religion in contemporary life and society. And I think, uh, I think a lot of the 19th century and middle 20th century thinkers got it wrong. Thank you, Chair.